Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, oh, I am muted. Uh, nope, I should be muted. Never mind. Everyone on Zoom, um, uh, I think you can all hear me. Um, if you have any questions, please just shout them out. I cannot monitor Slack or the chat during this uh, um, during this talk. Um, and same for everyone in the audience. Uh, I will not see Slack, so please uh, let me know if you have questions. And please do interrupt. Um, uh, so just as a bit of a preface to this lesson, we're, this is the PyTorch room, by the way. Um, if you want to be in bids, you want to be in Alder 103. Um, but just as a quick introduction, uh, PyTorch is a, a massive machine learning optimization numerical library. It does a whole lot of stuff, and we are going to cover a tiny fraction of what it can do. Um, this is not intended as any kind of uh, in-depth um, uh, lesson on everything in PyTorch. The goal of this lesson is hopefully uh, to show you that PyTorch is not uh, very intimidating. It's actually a pretty easy library to use. And in just the next hour and a half, hopefully, we're going to be able to build a neural network and train it on some very simple data. And so the, the idea here is, is not, again, is not to, uh, it's not to delve into the, uh, anything in much depth. It's just to give you a good overview and kind of enough to get you started in PyTorch. So um, that said, PyTorch is one of a few kind of preeminent uh, machine learning libraries that people use these days. Um, another one is TensorFlow you've probably heard of. I believe TensorFlow is, is uh, created by Google. PyTorch was Facebook's version. Um, I think there's also Jax. There's some other uh, libraries out there that people use and uh, like using. Um, I personally have only used PyTorch. Uh, I know that TensorFlow has a very similar interface and does a lot of the same stuff, um, but we're just gonna be talking about PyTorch today. A lot of the stuff we'll be doing is pretty transferable. Um, it's just that there may be slightly different syntax if you use TensorFlow. Um, additionally, I wanna mention that, although we're just gonna go through this one tutorial and we're gonna kind of do one thing in this tutorial or just a couple things, um, there are a lot of tutorials on PyTorch out there. So if you just go to pytorch.org slash tutorials, there are a ton of tutorials there. A lot of them are very good. There's a lot on YouTube. Um, in general, it's pretty easy to find tutorials on PyTorch, and so I encourage you to go look if you want to do something that I don't cover. Okay, so to get started, um, I'm here in the Jupyter Hub. Um, we're going to go ahead and go into curriculum, and then uh, the first one here is Benson Deep Learning. And in this directory, you may not have this data directory, that's fine. Um, in this directory is a notebook introduction to PyTorch. However, we're not gonna open that, or at least I'm not gonna open that. Um, I'm gonna do this as a live coding exercise, which hopefully goes well. Um, and I'm just gonna open an empty notebook and we're gonna walk through things uh, just kind of line by line. Um, the other notebook is uh, the introduction to PyTorch notebook has all the stuff that I'm gonna do in it and a whole lot of other text. So if you come back to this later, it's intended as a reference for you. So you can kind of go through and have in writing what I'm gonna say mostly. Okay, so um, to get started, if we're gonna use PyTorch, we're gonna to need to import it. So I'm gonna start by importing Torch. Can everyone see this okay? Do I need to make it bigger? Okay, um, so uh, PyTorch, the name of the PyTorch library is Torch. So we're gonna to import Torch. Uh, since we're gonna be building a neural network, we're also going to import from Torch, import NN. NN is their neural network namespace. So that just imports, NN is a namespace. It's not like an, well, it's not, it is an object. It's a namespace object or a module object, but uh, it's it's uh, it's sort of like Torch itself, a little, a little mini library. Um, we're also going to import a few utility things. So from torch.utils.data, import data loader. Um, a data loader is a class or a type, an object type for uh, feeding data into a training regime. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to it. Um, and then from Torch Vision, import data sets. So uh, Torch, like a lot of uh, machine learning libraries, comes with a number of built-in data sets for this exact purpose, for these kinds of, uh, of tests and, and tutorials. So we'll be using one of those. And then from torch vision dot transforms import to tensor. Um, and again, I'll talk about what this this is about in just a second. Uh, but we'll go ahead and run this. And uh, if at any point during this uh, I I start going too fast and things go off the screen, just 
flag me down and let me know that you need time to write stuff down. Okay, so um, you notice we imported this thing called two tensor, uh, and a tensor is just what PyTorch refer. It's basically PyTorch's version of a NumPy array. So uh, in fact, PyTorch is built on top of NumPy. Um, in in kind of PyTorch's background, it keeps track of data using NumPy arrays, um, and a tensor is in many many ways, not in every way, but in in most ways, pretty much the same as a NumPy array. So if you're familiar with NumPy. You shouldn't have too much trouble understanding tensors. But let's just look at some examples. So um, let's start by uh, using the torch zeros function. So notice that just like uh, NumPy has a bunch of functions in its sort of core namespace, like numpy.zeros, torch has a lot of very similar functions in its core namespace. And in fact, at first glance, the torch namespace and the numpy namespace uh, are very similar. So we'll start by saying torch.zeros and we'll just make uh, a matrix, uh, 10 by three matrix of zeros. Um, just like with NumPy, this will default to floating point numbers. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and say U uh, for this, this tensor U that we're making. Um, we're gonna set the first column to be equal to one. And then we're going to say U equals U minus 0.5 times two. And then we're just going to print U. So uh, right off the bat, if we just replace this with NP for NumPy, um, this would all run just fine. And it would make a NumPy array. And it would basically uh, give us back a NumPy array that looks kind of like this, um, except here we have a tensor instead of an array. So tensors basically is a synonym for array. It's just the tensor is uh, PyTorch's version of it. Um, now. Based on the fact that NumPy is the backend for PyTorch and PyTorch uses tensors that are basically NumPy arrays, you might expect that you can use NumPy arrays with PyTorch functions. And that seems like something that should work, but it does not, um, unfortunately. So as just a demonstration, if we import NumPy and we make an array, a similar array of zeros, and then we try to use the torch.mean function on this array, um, we're gonna get an error. It says the argument input for mean must be a tensor, not a NumPy array. So basically uh, PyTorch will, occasionally a PyTorch function will be fine with a NumPy array. Most of the time, it's not gonna like it. It's gonna, it's gonna throw some kind of error saying this isn't a tensor and I only work with tensors. Um, that said, uh, there are there, the tensors still do have NumPy arrays associated with them in kind of the back end. So um, it's pretty easy to take uh, a tensor, such as this, uh, this U tensor we defined just a little bit ago. I'm gonna make, I'm gonna hide that. Um, and we can, we can um, extract the NumPy array. So to do this, we typically say u.detach.numpy. Now, um, and then uh, I'm gonna go ahead and capture that as A, and I'm gonna print the type of A, and then I'll just print A as well. So you can see that that returns a NumPy array probably as expected, and it prints out uh, like a normal NumPy array. Um, so this detach function is in here, this detach method is in here um, because, uh, PyTorch tensors have a bunch of stuff uh, attached to them that don't go with normal NumPy arrays. So one of the main things, and we're going to talk about this in just a second, but one of the main things that PyTorch can do for us is it can keep track of the calculations we do on a tensor. And then uh, when we have some result, we can ask it to calculate the gradient of that result in terms of the input tensors. And um, I'll show you an example of that in a minute, but this is very valuable if you want to do optimization. Yeah. Uh a little bigger? How's that? Okay, let me know if I need to make it bigger. Um, uh, yeah, so in, in uh, contemporary optimization, um, I guess we don't have an optimization course this year, but in, in optimization or most optimization, not all optimization, but in most numeric optimization, the way that uh, we typically do optimization is we pick some point that we're starting at while looking for a minimum and we calculate the gradient of the function at that point. And the gradient always points in the direction the function is getting bigger. 
And so we take a step in the other direction. Basically, we take the opposite of the gradient, which always points in the direction that the function is getting smaller, and we take a small step along that direction, and then we have a new point, and we repeat the process. And basically, if we take small enough steps and the function is continuous, we'll be more or less guaranteed to always have the function decrease until we find some local minimum. That was a quick overview of Newton's method of optimization. And um, if you're interested in that, I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. But um, that's the basic idea. Any, any questions about this so far? OK. All right. So um, let's start by doing just a kind of simple, we're not going to do a neural network just yet. We're going to start with a kind of simple optimization problem to demonstrate uh, how PyTorch's optimization works. So um, to do this, we're just going to, this is just a somewhat arbitrary problem, but we're going to define a curve. So I'm going to have a curve function. This is going to be a, a parametric curve. Um, so as, as a reminder, uh, curve. Um, parametric curves are typically defined as something like x, y equals f of t. Um, so as t varies, you have uh, points that vary in 2D space in this case. Um, so we're going to define this like this. We're going to say curve of t. Um, we're going to say x equals torch dot sine of t minus one half. And we're going to say y equals torch dot cosine of t times two plus torch dot cosine of two times t plus three quarters. And then we're just going to return x comma y as a tuple. Now, um, this, like I said, this is an arbitrary function. This function doesn't mean anything in particular. Um, uh, but just, I'm going to go ahead and import uh, matplotlib here. And I'm going to go ahead and um, make a, uh, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's not call this x, let's call this t. I'm, I'm going to make an array of t values and we're going to calculate the function then we're going to plot it just so you can see what it looks like. Um, so uh, you're probably familiar with the numpy.linspace function, which gives you linearly spaced numbers between two values. So uh, since this is a uh, sinusoidal function, we're going to have the values be between zero and two times, uh, you know, I think I need to import numpy, two times numpy.py. Um, and we'll just use 100 points for now. So uh, just in case anyone hasn't seen this function before, this will give us back a vector whose first element is 0 and whose last element is 2 pi. And all the elements in between will be evenly spaced. Um, OK, so we'll go ahead and get that, that vector of t values. We'll say x, y equals curve of t. So that will give us back a vector of x values and a vector of y values, one per element in the t vector. And uh, then I'm just going to go ahead and uh, plot uh, x comma y, and I'll plot it in black. OK, so basically, um, this is just kind of a funny shape uh, curve. Um, uh, it is sinusoidal, so it repeats uh, over 2 pi. Um, it looks a little bit like the Star Trek communicator. Um, but uh, otherwise, it's it's not it's it doesn't have any particular significance. Um, and I'm just going to add a couple decorations to this plot to uh, um, let us uh, look at it a little more clearly. So I'm just going to plot some axes, basically. So we'll plot uh, an x-axis with the thin line, and then I'm going to plot the same thing, except we'll do the y-axis. It's a thin line. So that just that just gives you some perspective there. So these two lines are the same length. This, of course, is not a square plot, so it doesn't look square. But um, there's our kind of Star Trek communicator shape. OK. Yes, yeah, sorry. I'll give everyone a second. Any What questions do you have so far? All right. So. Um, we have this funny shape. Uh, the The point of making the shape a funny shape and not some uh, normal shape like a square or circle or something is that um, just looking at this shape, it's and just looking at these functions, 
um, suppose we were trying to find the point on this curve that is closest to the origin, closest to zero, zero. It's not obvious just looking at this. I mean, it's obvious that it's somewhere over here, I think. But um, it's not obvious just from looking at this or from looking at the formula for this curve what the what the value of t is that gives you the closest point to the origin. So this is something you know if you if if you remember your uh, your vector calculus, you could figure this out by taking the derivative and finding the zeros and all that. But um, we're going to pretend like we don't want to do that, and probably not even pretend we just don't want to do that. Um, and instead, we're going to to do this via optimization, via numerical optimization. So we're going to start by defining what's called a loss function. Now, if you've done much machine learning, you've probably heard of a loss function before. Um, it's also sometimes called an objective function or a potential function. But basically, the idea is that this function is, is high when whatever you're optimizing is in a bad state, and it's low when whatever you're optimizing is in a good state. So the closer you get to whatever you're looking for, the lower the loss needs to be. And the farther you get from whatever you're looking for, the higher the loss needs to be. So in our case, now in, in some cases, you don't necessarily have a really clean and clear example of what the loss function is. But in our case, we know exactly what the loss function is. It's the distance between the origin and whatever point on the curve. So if we're asked to calculate the loss of t, the first thing we do is we calculate x, y equals curve of t. And then we just want to know the distance from x, y to the origin. So um, I'll write this out as distance equals uh, torch dot square root, just like in NumPy, of x minus zero squared plus y minus zero squared, zero, zero being the origin. Um, and uh, in fact, I think I did this wrong. I think we want to say, um, uh, no, that's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Okay. Um, so that'll give us that'll give us a measure from the point uh, uh, on the curve that's associated with the par parametric value t to the origin. So once we've uh, then we need to return the distance. That's the final thing. Okay. Uh, once we've once we've calculated this, let's go ahead and just test it. So we'll say t equals torch dot tensor of one point five, just as kind of an arbitrary value of t. And I'm going to go ahead and say dist equals loss of t and print the distance. OK, so hopefully if you do, you're following along, you got that same value, um, assuming you, you have the same shape. Um, if, you, if you put in a different formula for the shape, this would all still work, uh, although I can't guarantee you won't find a local minimum when we do the optimization. OK, any questions so far? Okay, so uh, I mentioned a second ago that torch can calculate gradients for you. Um, and in this particular case, uh, we have this curve function. So, um, and we have this loss function. And so supposing we wanted to know the, the derivative of uh, the distance in terms of T, you know, again, we could solve this analytically by using, uh, using uh, differential calculus, um, but, when these functions get complicated, when you're working on a big machine learning problem where you've got lots of, you've got a whole neural network full of weights that are going into the calculation of the loss, or where your loss function is 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 complicated because, for example, you're trying to minimize something over a mesh or image or something like that, um, analytically calculating the gradients is always technically possible. It's just very difficult and can be very time consuming. Um, and in a lot of cases, it's not, it's just not obvious, especially once you get past one or two dimensions figuring out what the gradients is can be very difficult. Um, but fortunately, PyTorch will calculate these gradients for us. So uh, um, we're going to, once again, make a value for t. We're going to say torch.tensor. And we're going to start again at 1.5, but we're going to add another parameter this time to our, our torch or our tensor function. So, um, and by the way, I don't know if we covered this in the NumPy section, but you can make a NumPy array of a single number and torch is the same way. Um, a NumPy, whoops. Uh, if you say numpy.array of 10, this returns an array that's just 10 that has a, uh, an empty shape, basically. It's, a, um, it's considered a, a zero dimensional tensor, more or less. Um, and you can do the same thing in, in PyTorch as we saw up here. Um, but this time we're going to add this parameter requires 
grad equals true. And what this does is it tells PyTorch that uh, this, this, this uh, tensor here is going to be uh, a parameter to some function whose gradient we're gonna, gonna wanna calculate. So we're signaling to PyTorch that it should keep track of information about what calculations we, we use T in in order for it to be able to look backwards through the calculations and figure out the gradient. Okay, so we can now say dist equals loss of T, which we saw earlier will produce this, this tensor. And I'm just gonna go ahead and print here uh, dist just to show you that despite tracking the gradient, we're still gonna get the same answer. Um, and then I'm gonna say dist dot backward. Uh, and backward is a method that tells PyTorch to take this value or this tensor, uh, which needs to be just a single number, um, uh, but to take this, this single number tensor and calculate uh, the gradients back to anything where we, we used as input that required the gradient uh, to be calculated. So basically, um, in the process of calculating this loss, we calculated this X and Y, these X and Y tensors. And in theory, PyTorch might say, oh, look, you want the gradients on X and Y, but X and Y don't have this requires grad equal true, so it knows it's not done yet. So then it can look back and say, how did I get X and Y? Well, it came from this curve function, and the curve function is all done in terms of T, and since T has requires gradient as true, it says, ah, here's a parameter to this input uh, to the, the, that, that was used to calculate this distance, um, so I want to calculate the gradient uh, in terms of this T parameter. Okay, have I have I lost everyone? <laughs> we still still with me? Any questions? Okay, I realize we're we're doing a. a you may not have signed up for a review of uh, vector calculus, but here we are. Um, all right. So after we after we run this backward function, we can just ask it for t dot grad, which is the gradient. Um, and uh, when we run this, it's going to first uh, print the distance, which is the same as we had up here. Notice here that it has a little note about how this was calculated because one of the inputs required the gradient. Um, so this is just telling us it's keeping track of the calculation information for the gradient calculation. And then we have uh, finally t.grad is this uh, tensor who, uh, of 0 0.5118, which is the gradient of the distance or the derivative of the distance in terms of t. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the 1.5 in this tensor, it's just an arbitrary point I picked. Um, so you could pick another point. We could we could start with uh, with 2.5, for example, and we'll get a different value in a different tensor or a different uh, gradient. Um, but yeah, this is just um, this is just the value of t we're using, and I'm just picked an arbitrary one. Other questions? Yeah. Um, this is then like one of those like lower points in like the graph. So uh, this we haven't done any optimization yet. So we haven't we haven't uh, tried to find a low point in the graph yet. But this is just telling us which direction um, the low point is. So for example, with the value two point five of t, we calculated this loss and then we calculated the gradient of uh, of the distance in terms of t, and we got a gradient that's negative. So that means that as we make t smaller, distance will increase, and as we make t bigger, distance will decrease. So it tells us what direction we need to change t in in order to get to the minimum. Okay. Yeah. So that's the basic idea. Yeah. Yep. Are we only going to be doing local optimization? Yes. In this demo, we are only going to be doing local optimization. Um, global optimization is much harder. Um, and involves kind of meta strategies, usually like starting from many different points or simulated annealing. Um, and we don't we don't have time to do that, unfortunately, today. Well, I hope we can get through this whole tutorial. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. OK, great question. What's the difference between local and global uh, optimization? So let's let's uh, look at this this uh, um, image as an example. So. Uh, Supposing I start my optimization from um, somewhere like here on the uh, on the the curve, 
the local optimization or I mean, whatever kind of optimization we're doing, the gradient is going to tell us to go this way if we want to make the value smaller, the, the distance to the origin smaller. Um, but at some point, it might start getting bigger because we've reached a local minimum. Now, that I, that was maybe not a very good example. Suppose suppose we were instead trying to find uh, an easier example to explain. Is suppose we were trying to find the farthest point from the origin. Um, now, that point is up here, uh, clearly. But if I started my search right here, I would get to this point, and then whichever direction I went, it would get the we would get closer to the origin, and so it would say, "Hey, I found the minimum." But it's not the global minimum; it's just a local minimum. Um, in order to find the global minimum, we need to start our search from many different points and see which one came out as the the smallest, um, or some other strategy. Uh, and yeah, so so you can see how this is this can be a, a much more difficult problem. You have to know something about your function to know whether or not you found the global uh, minimum. And so we're we're not going to get into that, but we'll, we're just going to do local optimization for now. But great questions. Um, any others? Yeah. Sorry, so the curve is like is zero at like four points on that uh, plot. Why? What makes one point one and minimum better than the others? Uh, so the derivative may be zero at all four points, but one of those four points will have the smallest actual calculated value. So the distance will be smallest. So we have we have both the distance to the origin, uh, and we also have the gradient of the distance in terms of t. So the gradient of the distance in terms of t equals zero. That just means that whichever direction you go along the curve, it's it's you're getting farther from the minute the origin. But um, uh, uh, at, at each of those positions, you can have a different actual distance. Like they're going to be a different distance, and whichever one has the smallest distance, that's the global minimum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, ask again if if we don't if if I don't cover it. Yeah. Yeah, so in this case, um, we're our, our t values are just going to range over the real numbers because um, we are using a this particular sinusoidal function and cosine and sine are operate over the real numbers. Now, realistically, since it's cosine and sine based, we could just limit it to zero to two pi. Um, but since we're doing a local local optimization, it's not really going to matter either way. We'll find the closest t. And then if it's outside of zero two pi, we can just put it back inside the range by adding two pi or whatever. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. All right. So um, let's go ahead and uh, just to kind of demonstrate the um, the strategy of optimization with this very simple example before we do a neural network example. Um, let's go ahead and find the the actual uh, minimum. And I'm going to give us a starting point that guarantees that we'll find the global minimum. Although it's just because I know what starting point will end up there. It's not because um, there's something magic about the optimization we're going to do that always finds the global minimum. So uh, we're going to start with uh, torch.tensor two, at 2.1 um, with, sorry, with t equal to 2.1. And we need to tell it that we're requiring a gradient. Um, and then next, what we're going to do is we're going to define what's called a PyTorch optimizer. So this is just a, a, a type of object that manages most of the optimization details for us. So for this, we're going to say optimizer equals torch.optim, which is a sub package in the PyTorch package, um, dot SGD. SGD stands for Stochastic Gradient Descent. It's a type of, um, of, minim of minimization algorithm. Um, that's slightly stochastic, but mostly follows the gradient. Uh, we will also see another one called Adagrad later, um, which is a more commonly used one for neural networks, but this is one that works really well for simple problems like this. Um, and we're going to give it a list of, uh, uh, of input parameters that it's going to minimize over. So in this case, just T. Um, okay. And then we need to give it one more parameter, which is LR for learning rate. And learning rate basically tells it how, how fast is it trying to get to that minimum. So when it, it calculates uh, the distance from the origin for one single t and it gets that uh, gradient, it, it, it knows what direction it needs to go, but it's going to take a step in that direction. And we need to tell it how big of a step. 
if it takes a really big step, it's going to way overshoot the, the local minimum and we're going to end up on the other side and that's bad. If it takes a really small step, it's going to take a really long time for us to find that local minimum. So unfortunately, I don't have good advice on how to pick a learning rate. You kind of have to pick it experimentally in my experience. Um, they tend to be, a, the learning rates you want to use tend to be different for different optimizers. So um, in my experience, there's not a, a clear way to pick this, but in our case, we're just going to pick 0.05 and not think about it too much um, and just trust that it's going to work. Okay. Um, now we're actually ready to run the optimization, and we do that by taking some number of steps uh, towards the local minimum. So we're going to say for step number in range 20, we'll just do 20 steps. Uh, first things first, we're going to say optimizer dot zero grab. So we always start out uh, um, a, a, a step in the optimization process by telling the optimizer that we're starting over with a new step and it should zero out the gradients. The reason we have to explicitly tell us tell it to do this has to do with the way that gradients are additive. And so uh, um, PyTorch doesn't necessarily know when you're done doing calculations. And if you don't zero out the gradients, instead of uh, getting the gradient for this step, you'll get the gradient of the last step plus the gradient for this step. Um, and so we have to tell them to zero out. We can then just say dist equals the loss function of t. And uh, I'm just going to put a print statement here so that we can watch the progress. Step number um, is step number. T equals, um, and I'm going to turn t into a float for this uh, print statement, just so it looks a little nicer. Um, and then loss equals, and again, uh, turn the distance into a float. Okay, so that's just a little uh, in information message that we'll get every time this goes through a step. And then um, I'm gonna say dist.backward, just like we did earlier, to signal the PyTorch that it needs to calculate those gradients. Um, and then we say optimizer.step. So the optimizer already knows that T is the parameter that we're trying to minimize over. Um, so uh, we don't need to tell it what to minimize over. It's gonna, it's gonna look at these gradients that have been calculated for T and it's going to make the step for us. So we don't, we don't have to tell it really anything else. Um, that's the end of the loop. Um, and then finally, I'm just gonna have it print uh, T and the loss of T so we can see the minimum. Okay, before I run this, uh, any questions on this code block? Could you repeat uh, one more time why we need to zero out the gradients? I didn't quite yeah. get it. Um, so it's, uh, so the, the reason we have to zero out the gradients is because PyTorch doesn't necessarily know when we're done with a step. So just because we've called uh, a backward function um, or a step function, PyTorch doesn't necessarily know that we're done. It, it, in some optimizations, you may continue using these gradients. Um, and so by default, if you keep using your, uh, your parameters as part of, uh, calculations, it will keep adding to the gradients because in general gradients are additive, um, in the sense that if you have like F of X plus, uh, G of X, the gradient is the gradient of F plus the gradient of G. Um, so, uh, essentially there, that, that's a very long way of saying that sometimes it's useful not to zero the gradients and have the gradients add up over the course of a few steps. Um, and so you have to explicitly tell it to start over, clear the gradients, we're going to do a new step. Um, does that more or less answer your question? I'm sorry if that's not a very satisfying answer. It has to do no, with No, I got yeah. that. Thank you. That makes okay. sense. Great. Yeah. So with like setting C, you can get around that. I'm sorry? If you set seeds in your environment, you can get around that. If I set seeds? Set the seeds. So like where the Python starts running, see when it works like. You mean like, well, in my mind, the 2.1 here is the seed. Is that what you mean by seed? So if you ran like several lots and you're like running randomly, so you can randomize, create your random Oh, create, sorry, I see, I see. Um, right, if we, if we like set a new random seed or something and then, uh, so um, there is some randomization in this process, 
but and I'm I'm sorry, I forgot what you were asking about specifically. Oh, so if you set a seed, would it start the gradient from the same spot every time, or zero or time if you like it, or that doesn't work? Yeah, so the gradient wouldn't be dependent on the seed. Okay. Um, the the only thing that's dependent on the randomization is this step here. So the step will look, and basically what the step does, I think, is it looks at the derivative and it says, okay, I'm maybe I'm going to randomize the direction of the of the gradient a little bit, and then I'm going to do a little bit of randomization on the distance I, I take, of uh, the step I take. Um, so that's the only thing that I think is affected by the random seed here. Yeah, yeah, I, I get you now. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, dist dot backwards, since dist is the output of our loss function, um, it's basically a PyTorch tensor with a single number in it. And backward tells PyTorch, we want to calculate the, the gradient of this, of dist, um, in terms of whatever the parameters were that required gradients according to this uh, requires grad option. So basically backwards says, hey, start with this dist value, look back through the, the chain of computations that PyTorch keeps track of under the hood, and calculate the gradients as you go. And when you get back to an input to this function that required gradient, save uh, attached to that input, save its gradient uh, or the, the gradient of dist in terms of this, this parameter. So after we run dist.backwards, t.grad will be the gradient of, of dist in terms of t. Um, and then optimizer.step basically knows that um, we, we told the optimizer that t was our parameter. And so optimizer.step says, okay, take your parameters, look at the gradients on them, and take us an optimization step uh, along that uh, along the, the opposite of that gradient. Okay. Great. Any other any other questions? Okay, so let's just run this then. So it's pretty quick. Um, PyTorch is very fast uh, at these kinds of things. That's one of the reasons we use it. Um, and you'll see, if you look here, we started at 2.1 and it's kind of slowly uh, uh, varying T up towards about 2.6. Um, the loss you can see is, is going down, uh, starts at about 0.83 and it goes down to about 0.448. Um, and at the end, we have uh, T is this first tensor. Um, you can tell because it's required the gradient. Um, and it's at the end of this, it's about 2.7. And uh, the distance, which is the second thing we printed here, is about 0 0.4301. So this is going to be very close to the actual um, minimum for this loss function. Uh, and if we want, uh, we can just real quick, um, I'm going to say x not y not equals curve of T, since T, um, as a reminder, T is has actually been minimized. So this is the actual uh, uh, T value that minimizes the function um, or the, the loss function. Um, so we're going to go ahead and grab that point uh, on the curve. Um, I'm going to say x not equals x not detach dot numpy and y not equals y not detach dot numpy and um uh i'm gonna i'm actually going to scroll up here to where we plotted this function and i'm going to just copy all this code um because i want to make a plot of this function and then we're going to plot the actual minimum point so uh i'll leave this for a second but basically you, we just want to copy all of this and go back down here and I'm going to go ahead and plot everything. I'm going to change this uh, this t. Uh, uh, I'm I'm going to I'm actually going to get rid of this line, and instead of uh, overriding our t variable, I'm going to pass curve a numpy array of the same value zero comma two times np dot pi comma one hundred, like that. So this will make x y be basically the same points for the curve that we saw earlier. It's going to plot that. Um, it's going to plot those two axes we drew. And then finally, I'm going to have it plot um, x naught and y naught as a red dot. So we can see where the minimum was. I made some mistake. Ah, um, curve expects a tensor. So I needed to make this uh, uh, a torch tensor. I guess I can't do it the way I wanted, but I can easily enough just attach these 
you know, I actually don't know offhand if uh, PyPlot will work with PyTorch tensors. It might. <laughs> um, some functions do and some functions don't. But there we go. So there again is our Star Trek communicator shape. And you can see that the point it found is this little red dot here, which uh, whether or not that's exactly the right answer, it looks pretty close to me. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? Uh, detach tells NumPy that you want a copy of the tensor that no longer has any of the mechanism for keeping track of the um, the gradients uh, attached to it. So it sort of it sort of disentangles the variable from the PyTorch backend, um, and you want to do that because if you don't do that, then when you get x not dot NumPy, if you change x not, you might end up screwing up the gradient calculations. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so just to check my understanding, so if we had a very large step function, or I guess a very large rate, mm -hmm. right, right, solution that's further from the origin, you can do that half over the closest solution. Yeah, so uh, all kinds of things can happen when your learning rate is bad. Um, if you have a really high learning rate, oftentimes it will start oscillating back and forth. Um, like it'll basically, it'll take too big of a step past the minimum. And then it'll say, oh, the gradient's pointing the other direction. I got to take a step this way. And it'll take too big of a step in the other direction. And you'll end up with these weird dynamics where your 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 op, your quote, quote unquote minimum is, is expanding in weird ways. Um, that's that's one of the things that can happen. And it can just go past and then come back sometimes, but um, if you're lucky. But uh, it, typically, like when I do these kinds of optimizations, I try a number of learning rates and and compare them and see which one seems to be working best. Yeah. How do you how do you sorry, how do no, you compare them much less to like Yeah. So it's it's usually easy to tell when the learning rate is is blowing up or something because your loss function is not going down. Um, so if your loss function is going up, that's like, like your loss function should really never go up during optimization if things are working right, um, because uh, the the step along the gradient, as long as you have a continuous function, should always go down. Yeah, it or, or um, and if the gradient's flat, then it should throw some kind of error saying I can't go anywhere. The gradient's zero. Yeah. Good questions, though. Um, other questions? Okay. Okay, so um, this is all kind of introductory, uh, basic um, optimization stuff that we've talked about so far. Um, I do use PyTorch for these kinds of optimization problems, uh, usually not quite this simple, but um, I do find it to be useful just as an optimization toolbox, um, in addition to like a neural network toolbox. Um, but what we're gonna do now is we're gonna actually build a, a neural network that, and then optimize the neural network uh, to predict uh, what kind of article of clothing we're looking at from this particular data set, a kind of a sample data set. So um, before I jump into uh, neural networks, this is your last chance, not really, this is a chance to, to ask any more questions about optimization. Okay, so um, we're gonna work with this data set called the Fashion MNIST data set. I don't know what MNIST stands for offhand, um, but it's some it's some data set of little highly pixelated images of clothing. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to train a neural network to predict what kind of clothing each uh, image is. But first of all, we're just going to download it. So we're going to start by saying training data equals data sets. So remember, we imported um, at the very top of this notebook, we imported uh, somewhere. Yeah, Torch Vision, we imported data sets. So this is a, a sub-module of the Torch Vision uh, library, which is a companion library to PyTorch that has some of these kinds of data sets and tools and stuff. Um, we're gonna say datasets.fashion and IST. Uh, we're gonna tell it a few uh, parameters. Um, root is the directory we, we wanna save it, the data in. We're just gonna call that data, that'll be fine. Um, this isn't a big data set, so would not be a problem. Um, train equals true. I believe that I believe that just tells it that we're going to be using this for training. Um, download equals true. We want it to download it, not to just uh, pull it every time we we ask for it. Um, and transform equals to tensor. So um, 
notice that we we imported this two tensor uh, from the utilities or from the the torch vision transforms earlier. Um, two tensor is a kind of uh, sort of like a factory class. It basically what we're what we're telling this is that we want um, when we ask for an image, we want it to return it as a tensor, um, not as like a, a NumPy array or something. And that's what this this tells it. Okay. Um, now we also want to download some test data or also sometimes called validation data. So datasets.fashion and, and IST. Again, we're going to put this in data. Um, and this is not training data. So this will give us a different set of pictures. Uh, we do want to download it. And again, we want to transform them into tensors. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and run that. Um, on in my case, I believe I already downloaded these, so it was like instantaneous. Um, for all of you, it may take a minute to download. Probably not very long though. It's not a very big data set. Okay, so that was just to download the data we're going to use as example data. Um, any questions? Okay. Okay, so. Um, real quick, uh, the way that um, most neural network training works is that you have what's called a batch. Um, so uh, when you do training on neural networks, you typically take a bunch of inputs in one batch and you give them to the network and you have the network look at those in batch. And that speeds up certain aspects of the training. Um, there's a lot of discussion in this on batch sizes in other tutorials. We're not going to talk about it very much. I'm just going to let you know that it's it's a common kind of speed up a thing that, that is used in neural networks. So we're gonna go ahead and define a batch size of 64. Basically, we're gonna tell the, the neural network to train on 64 images at a time. Um, and it has, the optimizer has its own way of, of handling that. Um, now we're gonna go ahead and make some data loaders. So again, data loader was something we, uh, we imported earlier um, from torch.utils.data. Basically, data loader is a class that takes uh, your training data and your your uh, uh, test data and has some nice utilities for feeding the data into um, uh, a step function or a step loop for an optimizer. So we'll start by defining them. Say so data loader training data, um, which we we of course just downloaded here. Um, and we're going to say the batch size is the batch size we just defined. Uh, we'll do the same thing for test data loader. Test data size plus batch size. And then uh, just to kind of demonstrate what uh, um, what the test data loader is like, um, we're going to say four x y in test data loader. Um, and then we're just going to print shape of X image channels. So uh, this will make sense in just a second. Uh, whoops, X start. D type. So here we're just printing, we're printing the shape of X um, as well as the D type. And this uh, will make sense in just a second. And then we're going to do the same thing for Y. Copy this line. Now, uh, if I run this loop as is, it'll go through the whole uh, data loader, but I don't wanna do that. So I'm just gonna have a break command at the end of this loop. So it'll just go through it once. Um, the point here is that uh, data loaders are intended to be used in loops like this, where you loop over these batches of images that it feeds you. And it does all like the random randomization of the order of the images and that kind of stuff for you. But if we run this, it just prints out the shape of X and we can see that the shape is 64 by one by 28 by 28. So what that's saying is that the first dimension is the batch size. That's how many images are in one batch that gets given to PyTorch for training. The next dimension is the number of channels. 
So a channel in a typical ping file would be like red, green, blue. Um, those are the three channels in typical RGB images. Um, in this case, these are just grayscale images. So there's just one channel and that's why that's a one. And then the images themselves are 28 by 28 pixels. So they're very, uh, uh, they're very, they're very small. And in fact, let's just look at one real quick. Um, so we know that the shape of X is batch slide by image channel. So we can say X um, and we just got X here. So we'll say X of zero comma zero. And that will be a 28 by 28 image. Um, let me speak show. You can see this is a picture of a shoe. So this is, this will give you an idea of what quality of data we're training the neural network to uh, predict. Yeah. You're right. That should have been a capital X. Um, it got the other X from earlier up here. <laughs> yeah, so a uh, good catch. That was a typo on my part. So that should be a capital X. Um, and we get the same answer in this case, but um, good catch. Other questions? Okay. Am I going too fast? Has everyone got everything copied down? All right. Okay, so um, we're gonna predict, we're gonna train this network to predict a label. Um, so we want this to know that this is a shoe, uh, but predicting a label is not the kind of thing a network typically does. Instead it predicts a number and the label, the label is just a number um, rather than like a string. But we're just gonna um, come up with a list of labels here. Uh, and this is actually part of the data sets uh, on like the web page for the data sets. Uh, you can find these. Um, basically the first label is a t-shirt or top t-shirt. The second label are trousers. I guess this is a British data set. Pullover, dress, coat, sandal, shirt, sneaker, bag, and finally, ankle boot. So I'm guessing that this is in fact an ankle boot. Um, I'm, I, I suspect. <laughs> uh, okay, I will make sure to leave that up long enough that you can all get it down. But basically, these are the, the names that go with the label numbers. We'll be training the neural network to predict a label number. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, let's go ahead and just uh, make sure these labels make sense. So I'm going to go ahead and make um, I'm going to make a four panel figure in matplotlib. Um, in case you haven't seen this before, uh, basically there's a function in matplotlib called subplots, where you can say I want two rows and two columns of axes, uh, and um, you can give it a figure size. Uh, I'm going to make this a four by four figure, four inches by four inches. Um, and uh, I'm gonna take the axes. Uh, this returns a figure object and a, an array of axes. Um, so if I just run, run this by itself, we'll get, you see that there's like an array of axes and then you see the four axes. So um, I'm gonna actually take the axes and flatten them. And that doesn't do anything to the actual image that just takes this array and makes it a vector of axes instead of uh, um, a matrix of axes. And then uh, I'm just going to say uh, we're going to loop over the training data loader and plot a few of these and then break. So um, for four x batch y batch in train data loader. So we're going to uh, pull out some images from the training data loader. Um, and then we're going to uh, iterate over um, oops, uh, individual elements in the batch uh, along with the axes um, by using the zip function. So have you all seen zip before? Okay, I see some yeses and nos. The short answer or the short explanation is that zip takes multiple lists and turns them into tuples. 
Uh, that was not useful. Let's try again. So if I zip one, two, three with A, B, C, I get back one A, two B, three C. So when I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to zip axes X batch and Y batch. And what this will do is it'll give me um, a bunch of tuples, the first element of which is always one of the axes. The next is one of the elements of the X batch, and the next is one of the elements of the Y batch. So this is this is a fancy way of iterating over the axes along with one uh, image and one label for each axis. Um, and then we're just going to say uh, uh, we're just going to plot uh, X, and because X has a single image channel, we're going to say X of zero. Um, we're going to set the title of that axis to um, be the name of the label that we uh, just defined for Y. So here Y um, is the, since since it gives us the inputs and outputs when we when we run, when we iterate over the data loaders, um, Y is just the labels and X is the images. So we're going to turn that label into a string and print, set it to be the title. And I'm just going to turn the axes, uh, the the actual like uh, labeled axes off, so it's a little easier to see. And once we've gone through one set of axes, we're just going to break here because we don't actually want to make multiple plots. We just want to make one plot for each. So when we do that, we get this nice little uh, uh, image of the first four um, uh, first four images in the data set uh, labeled ankle boot t-shirt. These look approximately right to me. And we'll we'll copy this code later and use it to validate our our model as well. Okay, I'll scroll up so people can see that. Uh, but any questions on on this so far? Okay, so again, um, the goal that we're going to have here is we're going to build a neural network that looks at one of these images and comes up with this label. Um, and to do that, we're going to use our training data set, which has these batches of images that are paired with uh, batches of labels um, that go with the image. So to do this, uh, we're going to need to define an actual neural network. Um, and PyTorch makes this quite easy. Uh, we're going to make a class, and I'm just going to call it neural network. Now. Um, uh, a question that I've often got, I often get when I, I teach this kind of stuff is, um, is this a convolutional neural network? What's the difference between a convolutional neural network and a normal neural network? Um, this is not going to be a convolutional neural network. Uh, this is just a, a kind of basic neural network. Um, and I know that the title is deep learning, but deep learning is a is uh, actually a very broad topic. And deep learning is really anything that involves a neural network with more than one layer. Um, that includes convolutional neural networks. Um, but in this case, uh, doing a convolutional neural network is a little bit overkill. These images are very simple. Um, they don't really require uh, that much processing. So we're going to use a pretty simple neural network. And that way, uh, the training will go a lot faster. Um, if people are interested in convolutional neural networks, I'd be happy to talk about them later, uh, possibly in the review session today um, or next week. But uh, um, for today, we're just going to focus on a simple neural network. That said, the code for a convolutional neural network is very similar, um, uh, and you'll see why in just a second here. So we're going to define this neural network class, and we're going to have it inherit from uh, nn.module. So um, as a reminder, nn stands for neural network. Earlier, we said from torch import nn. Um, so that's just the neural network package. And a module is basically uh, a type for neural network models. So um, by inheriting from the neural network module, um, we inherit from we inherit a bunch of useful utility functions and machinery for calculating uh, models and for like saving them out to disk and reading them from disk and all kinds of stuff. Um, the module class has lots of functionality. We're just going to use a little of it. Um, but the main thing for today is that it makes it very easy for us to define this class and have it work with PyTorch. Um, so when we define a class, we typically need to define an init function uh, to get it to get it set up. Um, and this is where we we really define the structure of the neural network. So we're going to build the neural network in this init function. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create what's called a flattened layer. Um, and I use the term layer. Uh, neural networks have layers. There's a series of operations that get applied uh, to the input, and then you have the outputs. 
Um, and basically they, you kind of filter the input through these layers. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna flatten the image into just a, a like a, a flat vector um, because that's a little easier for uh, PyTorch to deal with. Um, and we use uh, the neural networks flatten uh, type. This is basically a type of object that works in these neural networks as a layer and will flatten the input. Um, we're now gonna make what's called a stack of layers. Um, I'm gonna make a linear uh, ReLU stack. Uh, and this is gonna be what's called a sequential uh, object. So basically this, this uh, member variable of our neural network class is gonna contain a stack of layers uh, for the neural network that we're gonna feed the, the flattened images into. And so we're just gonna put a bunch of different operators here. The first one is a linear uh, neural network operator um, and it needs to know how many inputs we're gonna give it. And since our images are 28 by 28, there'll be 28 numbers in the flattened, uh, the flattened inputs here. So we do 28 by 28, sorry, 28 squared numbers in the flattened input. Um, so we, we tell it that that's the size of the input it's gonna get. Um, and then we need to tell it how big of an output we want to produce. So what this is going to do is it's going to create a single layer of, of a neural network where it expects a bunch of numbers and it's going to have uh, neurons that recombine those numbers into a new layer of numbers. And we're going to actually have 512 numbers in the output. Um, so uh, the, the basic idea here is that this linear operator has a bunch of weights that it uses for each of these 512 outputs, it has some linear combination of the 28 by 28 inputs that goes into that output. So there's a whole bunch of weights that tell it how to turn these inputs into 512 different outputs in a linear way. And those weights inside of this linear operator are what we're actually gonna train uh, in the network. They're basically the parameter space that we're optimizing over. Yeah. Sorry, why didn't you use five hundred twelve? Uh, arbitrary. Not there's uh, not a particular reason. Um, uh, and in fact, you'll find that a lot of neural network stuff, those choices are kind of arbitrary. There's not. Um, there's a little bit of like black magic going on in choosing these things. Um, and uh, in general, if you give it, if you use a bigger number here, you're you're giving the network more internal state. So in theory, it could learn more. But that may also mean that it's less constrained, and so you need more inputs or something like that, or more training time to get it to work well. So there's kind of trade-offs here that we're going to play with. Um, I'm picking 512 because I know from tests that it works, or it kind of works. Yeah. About half the times that I ran this demo, um, the network produced very crazy outputs for the images, so we'll see if it works this time. There is a little bit of randomness in this. Um, Okay, so then we're going to add a ReLU operator and then another linear operator. Um, whoops. Uh, so, okay. Um, I'm actually blanking on what ReLU stands for. Uh, does anyone anyone out there happen to know? Yeah. Rectified, Rectified linear unit. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, uh, rectification is uh, the process of usually taking the absolute value. Um, so you, so this, this linear, um, this linear filter is going to take those inputs. It's going to recombine them into 512 outputs. Those 512 outputs could range over the real number line. Rectification is where usually you just take the negative values and you make them zero. And the way to think about this is that, um, the, or the reason you'd want to do this is because it kind of gives the network, uh, a bit of like an if statement in the middle. It's it it, te it it looks at the numbers and says, okay, these ones turned out negative. I'm gonna I'm gonna zero them, and that gives the network kind of something. Um, uh, uh, it's it's a little bit analogous to like a choice that the network's making. Um, so those, these these are these are kind of frequent uh, components of these networks, um, but uh, this doesn't change the size of the input or output. So at this next linear layer, we're gonna make another linear layer, and it's gonna have 512 inputs because we have 512 outputs here. Um, and we're just going to recombine this into 512 different outputs. So um, this is just a linear combination of 512 values into 512 new values using a new set of weights. And we'll just make another more, a couple more of these. I'll have another rectified linear unit. Um, and then we're going to have another linear. But this time, 
um, we basically want to turn this into uh, we, we want this to produce an output. And so uh, we want to we want to have a number of channels equal to the number of labels that we, we might want to produce. So the idea is that at the the output of this uh, this network will be a 10 dimensional tensor, each of which is the probability that the image evolved uh, um, a probability that the image uh, belongs to that particular label. So uh, I believe we have 10 labels. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. So we had ten labels. Um, so we want every image to produce one of to to have uh, one of these labels. Um, so we say that uh, we go from five hundred twelve values down to ten values. And then finally, we have one more uh, rectified linear unit. Yeah. In the middle, uh, it's not. Um, it just gives the network a little bit more um, freedom, kind of to to have more computations. Um, so essentially, we could add an arbitrary number of uh, whoops, uh, like if we wanted, we could we could add a few more of these, and it doesn't change the input or output of the network, but it it gives the network more complexity internally. Um, so theoretically, if we thought that this calculation needed to be more complex and have more weights in order to capture the full variance of the input space, we might want to do that. But um, in this case, we want to keep it simple, partly because we want it to train quickly. Um, and so we're going to we're going to keep it simple. Yeah. Is there ever a case where adding more layers is going to uh, make your output worse? Uh, or is it just a matter of so in theory, adding more layers doesn't take away the neural network's ability to calculate something. Um, if you can calculate it with n layers, you can calculate it with n plus one layers. But um, that said, it may make it harder to train. So you, you're giving it a bigger start kind of space that it's going to randomly start the training from because you've got more weights inside the network. And um, it can make it more likely you're going to start somewhere far away. It can make it such that your data set doesn't have enough examples for it to constrain all the weights. Um, these are the kinds of problems you get when you have too much inside the network. Yeah. So simpler is better as much here. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, that's just a general machine learning principle is that simpler is better. It's why you generally want to start with regression and not with the convolutional neural network when you have a problem. But uh, um, yeah, in general, the simplest, you want to make it as simple as possible, but no simpler. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Could you tell it to me? How do you decide on the order that these arguments are passed to the sequential neural network? Um, so again, this is one of these things that has, uh, um, it, it's a little bit of black magic. Constructing uh, neural networks is something that there's lots of research going on. Um, there, are, uh, like, if you go look at the neural network literature, there's lots and lots of papers that are like, we've come up with this new architecture for neural networks. It involves feeding things in this way and putting them in this particular order. And it works really well. And maybe they have a theory about why it works, or maybe they don't. Sometimes that just seems to work and we don't really know why. Um, in this case, the only things that really need to be the way they are is that we need to start with uh, an, an input size that matches the actual image input size. And we want an output size that matches the actual number of labels. But um, all of this between, we could we could have the internals be quite a bit different, and it would it would probably still work depending on what we we put. But um, in this particular case, uh, I I use these examples because I know they're going to work. Right, I use these layers because I know they're going to work pretty well, and they're going to train pretty quickly. Um, but in reality, when you're making uh, when you're making your own neural network for your own problem, my advice would be to start with a known neural network. Um, like a ResNet or a UNet or something like that, depending on the kind of problem you have, and uh, to modify it as appropriate uh, or as you need, as rather than trying to build a neural network from scratch like this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the the output of one layer always needs to match the input of the next layer. And some of these, like the ReLUs, they don't care what the output is because they're just going to operate over every element uh, independently. Um, so it doesn't care about the inputs or outputs. It's just going to keep it the same. So we have an output of 512, input of 512. Output here needs to match this one. Yeah. Yep. Um, good questions. Any others? All right. So um, 
that is our uh, initialization function. We only need to define one more function in here, and that is the function that actually calculates the model value. So uh, for this, we call it forward. Um, and it's always called forward. That's what PyTorch uh, requires it be called. Um, and this, and that's because it's the forward calculation function going from the inputs to the outputs. Uh, so we're going to have forward be in terms of x. And basically, we're going to say x equals, we're going to use this flatten that we made. We're going to say x equals self.flatten. Um, and then we're going to create uh, what's called logits. I'll explain what that means in a second. By running uh, this, this flattened x through the linear Rayleigh stack. And then we'll return logits. Okay, so um, logits are a way of representing probabilities that is uh, easier for uh, machine learning to deal with usually. So um, in general, uh, this, this stack is gonna produce numbers on the real line. It's not gonna produce numbers between zero and one uh, necessarily. Now we could try to train it specifically to produce numbers between zero and one, but that's pretty hard. Whereas if we train it to produce numbers on the real line, that's a little easier. It's much less constrained that way. But we can take the real line and we can turn it into a number between zero and one by using uh, the logistic function um, or by uh, like a sigmoid function, basically. So uh, you can think of like arctan is one of these examples. There are many uh, sigmoid functions, but arctan um, can be made to go from zero at negative infinity to one at infinity by just scaling it. Um, there's there's several different uh, uh, logistic functions and you can look them up on Wikipedia. Um, but basically, there's a particular one, uh, um, I don't remember what offhand what PyTorch calls it, that PyTorch uses, and it works pretty well for these kinds of problems. But the point here is that we get out real numbers, and we convert them into probabilities by uh, using one of these sigmoid functions. Is anyone, if anyone's not familiar with these, I'll show a quick example, but I just, I just want to make sure that uh, if, if you'd like to see an example, raise your hand, or say something on Zoom. Okay, great. We all know what it is. All right, so uh, we have this return logits, and that's something that PyTorch expects. It expects logits out of these models, so we can just uh, use that. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and instantiate this model. And I'm going to print it. And uh, PyTorch has some nice uh, stuff for, oh, I did something wrong. Ah. Um, I forgot to uh, call up to the the superclasses init function before um, I I made the flatten variable, and uh, PyTorch doesn't like that, so we have to add a call here. Um, this basically just says uh, call the the init function for the superclass um, before uh, we run all the rest of this. So let me try that again. And now that we've added that, um, this works, and you can see it's it's printing down here, sort of a, uh, a stack representation of all the layers of the in the neural network. So you can see the flatten, and then all of these things. So basically, what it did was it ran some dummy variable through the forward function and came up with a representation of the model based on that. Um, and if uh, what's what I think is really interesting about this is that if you have layers up here that you define but that you don't use. Yeah, they won't show up in the model because um, it, it knows what the model actually calculates. Okay. So we've defined a really simple neural network now. And uh, hopefully in the last 15 minutes here, we can train it. So um, we're going to start by defining a loss function, um, just like we did for our previous optimization example. But we're just going to use one of the built-in ones from PyTorch. So this one is called cross entropy loss. Um, the cross entropy is a just a, a, a kind of basic difference uh, uh, function. I don't know exactly how it's defined, but it's very commonly used for these kinds of um, uh, image problems. Um, it, you can think of it as kind of like uh, uh, the, the sum of square differences or something like that. But we won't we won't talk about it in detail. Um, we also need to define an optimizer. So uh, again, we're going to say torch.optim. 
Now, last time uh, we used SGD and we're just gonna use that again, um, but I just wanna mention another uh, optimizer, which is commonly used for neural networks is Adagrad. Um, it has the same parameters uh, um, as, as SGD. You just, you just pass it a list of the, the parameters you want it to optimize over and then a learning rate. But um, we're gonna go ahead and use SGD uh, again in this case. Adagrad is used, uh, it's the PyTorch has done a lot of, uh, a lot of the PyTorch groups have done a lot of research into Adagrad and it's uh, considered a really good, especially for convolutional neural networks optimizer, but we're gonna use SGD. We're gonna pass it model.parameters. Um, this is another one of those like pieces of tooling that PyTorch has built into any, anything that imports for, or inherits from module. Um, and it will give us back a list of all the weights that are part of this neural network. And then we're going to pass um, a learning rate. And this is a learning rate that I determined experimentally, um, one E negative three. Okay, questions? Okay. All right, so let's, uh, let's now go ahead and write our training loop. So I'm gonna start by getting the size of the training data set. So we can still use that same training and test data loader that we defined earlier. We'll just keep using them. Um, a data loader dot data set actually is the data set that it's using under the hood. It's the data loader gives you like, basically it feeds, uh, it feeds the examples from the data set into the, um, the optimizer in kind of a random order. Um, but this data set has the actual data set in it. So I'm gonna get the size here. And then we're gonna write our loop. So we're gonna say, for batch num and x, y in enumerate train data loader. So uh, if you haven't seen this enumerate function, it's kind of like the zip function, but it zips uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera, up with whatever uh, is in, in here. So um, basically enumerate, we said list of enumerate a, oops, b, c, we get zero A, one B, two C. That's that's what enumerate does. Um, so we're gonna uh, loop over the examples in our training data sets. Um, we're going to calculate the model prediction. Uh, actually, first we're going to zero the gradients like we did before. We're then gonna calculate the model prediction. We're gonna say that the loss is equal to our loss function. Um, and we're gonna tell the, the, the cross uh, entropy needs to know, needs two examples. Um, so we're gonna give it the prediction and the actual true label, which was given to us by the training data set in Y. So here we have an output and a true prediction and it's gonna give us a loss uh, between the two. Um, and then we're gonna run loss.backward to tell PyTorch to calculate our gradients. And then we're gonna tell the optimizer to take a step. And then finally, um, I'm just gonna print a little message here. If the batch num uh, is divisible by 100, we're going to say loss and current equals loss.item. Loss.item will give us the actual uh, the actual value of the loss, basically, um, like the, the numerical value. Uh, and then, so, uh, and then we're gonna tell it how many examples it's trained on. And to do that, we're gonna give it the batch number as well as the si times the size of the batch. So since we're getting 64 images every time we go through this loop, um, we wanna say 64 times, however many times we've been through the loop. Um, and then I'm just going to print it. The loss is a uh, loss. I'm going to limit that to uh, uh, just seven decimal points or seven digits. Um, and uh, the and then we're going to print out the number of examples we've seen. Um, and the total number of examples we're going to see. 
Um, so if you haven't seen these kind of weird, uh, first of all, if you haven't seen F strings before, um, basically anything inside of these curly braces get it, gets evaluated as Python and then put into the string. That's what F strings do. And this colon plus this text is basically fancy instructions for telling it to print floating point or integer numbers and to only print a certain number of digits so that we get nice kind of columns. Um, but otherwise, this print statement is just, just a print statement. Um, okay, I think we are ready to go ahead and run the training um, once this is ready or once you've got this copy down. Um, so I'm just going to run it. Now, this is going to take a little while, not too long, I hope. But you can see it's kind of slowly making progress here. And you can see that although the loss isn't changing a ton, it is going down um, as we, we go through our examples. Um, now, one of the nice things about PyTorch is that um, when it does these kinds of optimizations, it's very smart about going uh, off into the background and using all of your CPUs or GPUs or whatever it's running on. We don't talk about GPUs because we don't have GPUs on the hub, um, but it's pretty easy to make PyTorch run on GPUs if you've got them. Um, and uh, if you have like a great big server, like you're running this on a high performance compute center and you've got like 20 cores, it'll use all of them and it's very easy to make it do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, how does how do the batch statistics influence the training? So um, batches are usually picked uh, randomly, like the data loader will randomize things into batches. Um, it is definitely the case that the size of your batch for a lot of neural networks will change how well it trains. I, I don't personally totally understand what the reasoning for that is. Batch size is not supposed to change the answer that the net network converges on. It's only supposed to change the properties of how quickly and how it converges. Um, but uh, there's a lot of, I, I believe that there are a lot of shortcuts that go on where it does things like it looks over the batch and it finds the one that performed best and infers more from that one than others, stuff like that. Uh, but honestly, this is kind of outside of my area of expertise. I, but it's absolutely the case that if you vary the batch number, it will change the rate at which things converge. And sometimes um, it will change things about the answer mostly because it may take longer to converge or something like that. Um, it's generally recommended that when you're publishing like a neural network paper or something that you do what's called a grid search for hyperparameters. Those include the learning rate, those include the batch size, it's pretty much anything that's part of the optimization that isn't one of the parameters of the model. Um, and you just do a big search where you, you look across a bunch of different values and you see which ones perform best. So batch size is one of those, yeah. Other questions? You quickly scroll up to the class once again. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and I'll leave this here for just a second. Uh, yeah, so all um, we have now trained the, the model and all we have left to do here is to see whether or not it actually trained uh, well. So um, like I said, when I've tried this example in the past, um, usually it trains pretty well. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, we're going to find out in a minute here. Um, and uh, to do that, uh, I'm going to start by grabbing the code that print, printed these images. Um, so if you scroll up to the class and then you scroll just to the cell above it, um, I'm just going to copy this code. We'll come back to the class for a minute. Um, can I scroll past the class? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, great. So I'll come back down here. Um, so again, I'm just going to paste that code um, to set up the figure and axes. Uh, okay. So uh, we want to, now we could we could use the train data loader here, but instead we should use the test data loader if we're going to actually be evaluating the accuracy of the model. Uh, and we'll go ahead and do, uh, um, again, we're going to basically print stuff and then break, kind of like we do here. Um, and I kind of want to get a random set of images. So I'm going to, I'm going to put in here if np.random.rand is less than 0.9, continue. Um, this, uh, this basically says generate a random number between zero and one. And if it happens to be less than 0.9, um, 
start start the loop over. So this will just kind of ensure that every time we run this, we'll get a random different uh, draw of the, the function. That's all that's for. Um, okay, so now we're going to uh, loop over um, the batch, the the X batch and the Y batch. Um, and keep in mind that this Y batch is the correct label. It's the one that came in the data set. It's not the predicted label. Um, but we can go ahead and start by uh, plotting uh, the actual um, uh, the actual uh, image. And then we're going to uh, get our prediction by running X through our model. Now, recall that the model outputs a 10-dimensional tensor, or just a, a, a vector of 10 numbers, basically, each of which is supposed to be kind of like a probability. And the higher the, uh, and again, they were logits, so it means they're on the real number line, but the higher the real number, the higher the probability. So we just want to find whichever category it thinks is most likely. So we're just going to take the argmax, which is, is tell me which index in that 10-dimensional in that vector had the highest uh, value. And that'll tell us um, uh, what the, the label ought to be according to the model. So we just say torch.argmax of pred. Um, and that'll give us the uh, a, a zero through 10 number or zero through nine um, that matches that set of labels that we defined earlier. And then I'm gonna set this title here to be uh, the correct name um, and I'm actually going to, I'm going to pull this out and say true label equals, uh, is the label based on Y. And then I'm going to say label, or I'll say pr predicted label equals the same thing, uh, but for this label that we pulled out of the prediction. So apologies for my variable names not being ideal here, but uh, hopefully that's not too hard to follow. And then for the title, I'm going to say, um, I'm going to make another F string and I'm going to say the predicted label. Um, and then in parentheses, I'm going to have the uh, true label. Okay, so now we get to find out whether this worked. Okay, so um, I would say it seems to have done okay. This is correct, this is a trouser. I can see why it thought this might be a coat. Um, I can not really see why this was a trouser, I guess maybe. Um, and again, this maybe is similar to a coat. I suspect that if we run it a few more times, we'll see both better and worse examples. So here it's clearly got the trousers right, um, but it's got these wrong. Um, but you can see that it's, it's clearly generating predictions that are not crazy. Um, and here it's gotten several of these right, or well, yeah, three of them right. Um, now, if we had trained this for longer, um, we probably would have gotten a better output. If we had used a bigger neural network, we probably would have gotten more accurate outputs. But overall, um, for an hour and a half, I think we did pretty well to train it at all. <laughs> and um, it is producing something like reasonable answers, so I will call this a success. Um, and that's pretty much all the time we have. Um, I'm happy to stick around and answer questions for a while, um, or if you have any questions right now. Uh, but otherwise, um, uh, again, if you want to talk more about neural networks or convolutional neural networks, um, I can talk about them in the review session this afternoon, or I'd be happy to talk about them next week sometime. But otherwise, I think we can call it here. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming.